All right. Um, have we got everybody on yet? They are here. Okay. Um, okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the District 3 Friday Zoom. Um, I just want to, um, first of all, wish y'all happy year and thank you for joining. I, I do have an agenda for us today, and I did try to start typing it in, and I realized that I'm not doing a very good job. Um, we are going to start off with um, capacity issues, and we're going to start with tumor. Um, we're going to move from there to the Midtown High School capacity issue, and then we'll go into the pre-K uh, conversation that's going on in the cluster. Um, after that, we'll move on to HR, um, so just bear with me. And, um, and when we're done going through the items that um, uh, I have for us, I'm happy or whatever, whatever additional information we need to gather uh, with respect to what's going on in communities and have a discussion around that. So. With that said, um, uh, my understanding, uh, Mr. Drake is with us this morning I'm from facilities, and I'm uh, very excited that he's here. Uh, Mr. Drake, my understanding from the Chamber community with respect to the renovation is that they would like to have the expansion considered, especially due to the fact that uh, Chamber's current capacity is 520 and the school's current enrollment at 516 with the projections actually being lower uh, for that for their next year. Um, also, I've been told that there have been many new addresses that are not in the APS system due to all the construction and development uh, in East Atlanta. Um, families moving into the area, um, and of course, typically wanting to attend. Also, um, feedback that I've gotten from the community is that they would like to keep the tumor community together um, and not, even though we have capacity at East Lake and have capacity in, uh, in other facilities, they would like to have the elementary school stay together because it does have a very good, healthy blend of socioeconomic um, diversity. Um, and it has really brought the community together. Um, and um, they are looking forward to going to Cone because my understanding is that there are many families that will be able to walk to Cone uh, during the uh, renovation period. However, they are asking that the administration please reconsider the expansion of the 10 classrooms to um, have the elementary school uh, closer to that 800 capacity number. I don't know if you have, yeah, there you go. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, Yep. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So we we've looked at both uh, tumor and um, uh, Peyton Forest for additions, and and specifically for the tumor one, there is um, available capacity even in the existing schools plus schools that have that have been shuttered, including um, both um, East Lake and um, the Whiteford facility. So if we do. There are um, increases above our projections. Our projections, um, we we're, about, we're about to release, just so you know, we're about to release our new projections um, as part of our annual review process. That's going to be on that February board. Uh, there'll be a, a report, our, our first annual uh, capacity utilization report. And in that, you'll see uh, well, there's a, there'll be a, a table specifically for the Jackson cluster that we'll be looking at tumor, uh, their capacity at, um, it's a little bit different number than I, than, than you mentioned, the capacity of 588. Um, and then our projected enrollment out two years, because one of the things we're looking at in our new process is that we look out two years uh, with our projected enrollment of 465, um, and that will put them at 79% utilization. So we'll, that number, that report is coming out. I'm just going to give you a little bit of sneak peek of those numbers uh, specifically since you brought up. Before. Yes. Um, so, and um, is something I, I think there is because of the amount of elementary school capacity that we have Jackson cluster, um, that if there is any type of, we don't see it happening going above that uh, more than 
Uh, over the next few years, we believe their average utilization would be about 82%. But in, and if it does go above that, um, again, there's all these other options that we have. Okay. Well, I, again, I think the strongest sentiment coming out of the chamber community is that the community stay together. So if we do uh, find that we need to uh, utilize other uh, elementary school space, if we could just be thoughtful or if the administration just be thoughtful keeping the community together somehow and not go through a reason that would um, divide uh, the community. Yeah, and, and I agree in that there, if there were if there were any type of rezoning, it would be a community process where we would go through this. And you'll see that play out this spring um, uh, with other in, in other areas uh, or that won't affect tumor okay. specifically. Um, there is a uh, the, there's one comment about this. Do you want to? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I um, number of students in the Zoom that aren't currently attending. Um, Marshall, are you speaking specifically about tumor? I mean, I think it's relevant to tumor, but I mean, it's a broader comment, but specifically, yes. specifically in the Jackson cluster, historically, along elementary school capacity. There is seemingly big difference between the number of kids who are feel like people feel like are living in the zone versus attending the local school. So I'm just wondering if it's something that we can look at in the future if if trends change and more people decide to um, enroll in the local school, like that capacity could fill up quickly. So it it was just a comment. Sorry, it wasn't meant. No, for no, that I appreciate. Question, but I, I wish it's an exercise we'd go through. Yes, and 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 Monica, I don't know if anyone from the Tamer Elementary School has joined this morning, but um, it is a conversation that I've been having uh, with the community, and I just want to make sure that the administration is aware of their sentiment of wanting to um, stay together as a community. It's taken them a, a, a moment, so to speak, um, to to really find that synergy where the elementary school is really gaining momentum, and we certainly don't want to diminish that or un on weave uh, the the community that's uh, coming together and moving forward. So whatever we can do to to encourage that, um, and you know, like I said, they would really like to have the exp expansion. But I do understand uh, where the administration is coming from as well. Um, is there any comment, from anyone, with respect to the tumor uh, the tumor renovation or expansion? I don't. I want to make sure that we're having these discussions now and not at the end of the at the end of the when we go through the agenda, we've got quite a bit to go through. Okay, then I'll follow up with the community directly uh, offline. Um, on the next, uh, uh, Mr. Drake, the next piece I'd like to take advantage of is the midtown capacity um, issue. Um, and you correct me where I'm wrong, like you just did before. Uh, my understanding is our current capacity is around 1525 and our projected enrollment uh, for next year, and again, it sounds as though that those numbers may change, um, but my understanding is we're around 16, almost 1680, um, with a freshman incoming class of around 500. So I'm curious to know uh, where the administration is with that and how they're going to support uh, the high school with respect to this um, this increase in capacity. Sure. I don't know if Travis, if you want to take the first cut, then I can come fill in some of the details on the capacity. Sure, to just walk through kind of where we are um, as part of the annual review process that came out of facilities master planning um, that launches this year. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, the board um, submission of a board report for February, uh, which just data. Then we go for those schools to be addressed, um, um, particularly overcrowding, because we're not focused on under enrollment right now. We'll then look at um, some scenarios with the community in March, with narrowing it down in April, and then if there is any redistricting or rezoning, that will be going to the board in May for first read, uh, with any rezoning decisions taking place in fall of 2024, not this coming fall. What we're doing, um, we're connecting this past fall, many of you paid it in Chino's work with um, high school capacity and solutions, short-term and long-term solutions that um, do and don't include rezoning or redistricting. So we've kind of analyzed all of those and a working group starts probably next week, I think, an internal working group 
to see how do we support those schools that are facing overcrowding um, while we think of those longer term solutions that would be in effect starting in 2024. And so uh, principals are part of that, um, academics is part of it, um, equity um, to ensure that um, we're providing support for those schools facing overcrowding right now while we think of longer term solutions. Um, and I'll jump in if there's more questions, which I'm sure there will be after Tom talks uh, or uh, yeah. Dan talks capacity. Yeah. And uh, board member, uh, the those the fifteen twenty five is is the is the capacity is correct, and that sixteen eighty six I think it was sixteen seventy six something for next year is 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 the number that we have. Um, and for the again, what we're looking at is for the twenty four twenty five school year, that number is going to go up to seventeen eleven as our projection for, and you'll see that in that in this FEP report again. Give me a couple sneak peeks on that. So um, that's the number that we're going to be looking at. Because um, the spring process looking for the 24-25 school year. Okay. Um, so with that said, are there I know there's a lot of uh, Tamara, just it was at your hand being raised. Mm -hmm. yeah, please jump in. Whoever else, please, you know, either um and Keith will help me out, either raise your hand through the um the Zoom or you know, throw a question in the chat and, and let's just go ahead and have a conversation about this. Yeah, if I could. Uh, so you say the the meetings internally are going on now, and principals are involved in that to, to figure out what to do to support them in the short term. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if we're saying that there can't be any rezonings for next fall, right? So that's that that's what I'm hearing that there there will not be rezonings for next fall. Um, then, I mean, that's a lot of kids over, you know, and so what, I mean, I think people are wondering, what do we look at? I mean, are we looking at trailers? Sure. Um, and then, for next year. Yeah, and, and Dan may have some other ideas or may share as well, but part of this is also looking at, potentially looking at how the high school is currently being operated or being run, how classrooms are currently being used at high school level, um, core classrooms versus non-core classrooms, which determine the capacity rate um, and seeing what can be done um, to support there. Um, also looking at scheduling or other areas. What we've committed, the community has shared one of the things that have come up over overcrowding and under enrollment over and over again is having um, some awareness and plenty of time before decisions are made. And part of the review process was to make decisions in the spring, but give people a full year of transitioning um, of the next school year before we implement redistricting and rezoning. So we're trying to stick to that timeline of giving people as much notice um, as possible. Um, then I'll pass it to Dan if he wants to talk kind of capacity specifically to those schools. Yeah, so specifically for Midtown High School. So Midtown High School, has 94 uh, classrooms, instructional units, core, you know, total classrooms in the building, 94 classrooms. That includes the addition. Of those 94 classrooms, 61 are core classrooms. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's really that 61 um, times the 25 is how we get to the 1525 capacity. What when I looked at this, they had, um, and it's based on kind of an equity review, they had 68 classrooms um, that they thought were core. We, as part of our annual review process, we, um, for, we do enrollment projections and capacity calculations, and then we meet with the principal, or we send it to the principals, they have the ability um, to talk through that. So when we sent that number over, we did, uh, Principal Bachman and our team met, and we um, agreed that the 15.5 number, based on how they use the building currently, is the number. There is opportunity, though, that we could take some of those, if we can get that 61 number of four classrooms up by a couple classrooms, right number of classrooms that would help with the overcrowding, and the, there's other type of things, as, as Travis mentioned, with our scheduling and funding and all that type of thing that we had done um, for school year 
before the 24, 25 year districting effect. But I mean, you're considering when you do this, like the education delivery here, because I wouldn't want that to suffer the experience that the kids have just to fit more kids. In, sure. in a I, I will say this. Um, if you look at across the district, we looked at at all the high schools and you look at what percent of the classroom core Midtown High School is the lowest by far. Okay, that's the, you, you could say lowest, the most inefficient, the most, what, et cetera. So there is a lot of, of any high school, Midtown High School has the most opportunity for this type of relook at because of where they're at. So when we, when we put the addition on the high school, we um, put more non-core classrooms versus core classrooms. And this is something that we can look at um, in our working group that we've got for next school year. So when do you think people will know what what is going to be done for next year? When 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 will the community um, hear something about um, how it's going to be addressed? Hey, Travis. Sure. It, um, I plan as it'll be the same time that proposals will happen in March. So data is being shared at the February board meeting and then to the community in mid-February, um, or kind of it'll be shared at the, at the board meeting, but we'll do some intentional outreach in mid-February and then um, proposals will go in March. And so we'll include as part of that um, kind of short-term um, solutions um, as well. Um, Tamara, any further comments or questions? I, you just no, put yourself on mute. You. Okay, no worries. Any other questions from the community or um, I know Cynthia, oh, Cynthia, you've got your hand up. Okay, Cynthia, got you. Cynthia. Yes, and yeah, I'm here. Um, and I just, I appreciate the, the explanation that we just got. That's really important for the community to understand. Uh, I do I would ask the administration that we be very careful about uh, making sure that there's not a perception that that facilities is dictating curriculum. Uh, that that's that's hard for parents to understand and for the community to understand. And so, if we can be very careful to to, to draw that line and to make sure that we, we say that these are tied together because of how the building is used, but that, that facilities is not going to, to tell Principal Bachman, for instance, that she cannot offer a particular class. I think that that's a, a, a road we don't wanna go down. And I think that is often a misunderstanding within the community when we start talking about core versus non-core classrooms. Great, thank you, Cynthia, that's great feedback. Um, Akeem Williams, welcome. Um, I see you've got your hand up, you're next. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I have yeah, no worries. Good morning. Um, I was um, just joining the, the, the meeting to um, voice my concerns. You know, I'm out of maids cluster still, but, um, and this is the Midtown cluster meeting, but one thing that I don't see across the district um, is empathy, integrity, and compassion. Like, it's like a lot of leaders don't, don't they're not passionate about what they do for our students. It's 56,000 students and only one innovation center. How is that solving anything. Um, our students are not being, are not graduating um, ready for college and career. It's just, it's like the curriculum is being dumbed down or watered down and uh, the standards just keep changing. Just like the state of the district yesterday, we still don't know what, what's going on within the district. We have a plan for 2036, but what about in between? How do we make sure that these students are prepared for success? Um, corporations, yeah, they come in and they can help but when budgets cut start happening, won't funding for education be the first thing to go? Because they're not supposed to be, I mean, no, I'm not gonna say they're not supposed to be, but typically when they have layoffs and pay cuts and they have to look at their budgets, it's gonna be like, oh, can we just cut out this program? Can we cut out that program? And then where we're at, we're back at square one. So 
what like I don't even know what the state of the, dist- the district is like in previous years we we had measurable results we had numbers we could say oh this is what we're trying to get to this is how we're getting there and this is how we're measuring our success I don't see that across this district um well across the whole entire district the APS district is 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 mind-blowing and that's my only comment for today Akima, I appreciate it. And please don't ever feel um, as though, you know, this is only about Midtown. The District 3 is, you know, it's not just a representative of a little piece of North Atlanta, Midtown, and Jackson. But as a, your District 3 representative, I'm, I'm, I'm one of nine members on the Board of Education that's here to serve the entire district. So I really do appreciate your comments. And I know that, uh, plenty of folks from the administration are here to hear your feedback and can um, and share that so that the administration can uh, uh, potentially provide more information to the community about where we are now and we where we are headed to get to that uh, 2036 goal. So thank you for your comments. Um, Dion, I see your hand up. Good morning. Yep. yep. Uh, Board Member Olympias, before we get to Dion, um, just for clarity, are we are we opening it up for all concerns? Or are we trying to... Are we no, we're with... trying to focus on Midtown right now. Um, okay. Yeah. So we still have, you know, I know Mr. Drake's limited on time and I still want to get right. to preach. That's what I was trying to. So I'm trying, trying to, make to make sure we, we stay on Midtown. And if you have additional comments, we're going to have plenty of time. Y'all know that I, I give you as much grace as I can when we're here. I'm not, we're, we're, I'm here as long as you're here. So, you know, if we need to go till five o'clock, I don't know what we're going to do, but we'll go till five o'clock. <laughs> um, Dion, I take it you're talking about Midtown because I saw some of your comments in the, in the chat. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sitting at the tardy desk at Howard, so I apologize. I'm multitasking. Um, yes, I do have concerns about Midtown. There's rumblings of trailers um, coming back, course offerings being taken away. I will have a ninth grader there next year. Um, right now is decision making time to apply to charters, to apply to admin transfers, to apply to private schools. Um, we need to know if the experience at Midtown is changing now um, for next school year. Um, we've seen this happen time and time again in this cluster that things change and we are not informed before um, those items are changed and then the school year happens and we are shocked with what happens. Um, we are asking to be part of this process now. My question, um, Travis and others in facilities, what role at this point do parents and staff outside of the principal have um, in the current charter contract that APS has with the Georgia Department of Education and school-based decisions and a seat at the table um, to say how we would like our school to be run and some of these says on academic decision-making, core classrooms, et cetera. And I appreciate Cynthia, you elevated this concern. Board Member Olympiadis, you want me to share? Yes, please. I, I, I trust y'all with this <laughs> sure. uh, Morning, Dion. Yes, um, so I'll, I'll put the timeline back. We're, we're engaging community, so I would suggest um, coming out and uh, joining us in our conversations that will start in February. Uh, proposals will be shared kind of in March, and then we can start getting some feedback um, on those specific proposals. Um, at the school level, um, the GO team is the best place to talk about academic offerings um, and kind of what you want for your school. Um, but there's a balance that we have to make with kind of academics and how our capacity is calculated as a district and um, trying to find that balance with this um, internal working group. Um, um, we don't want to go one side where um, a school becomes limited to, to students because of a, uh, a specific programming. We want to make sure that we can offer um, quality education to as many students as possible. And so trying to find that balance between facilities um, constraints as well as academic program offerings. Um, and so we're doing that both internally and then, um, like I said, um, um, come join us, which um, will start in kind of February, but um, really we'll dive deeper into those impacted schools in March. But we are over that number of what our building can hold. So um, based on the capacity that you've already shown, correct? On some of the numbers you've already shown next year, we have 500 students coming in, is that correct? 
Uh, um, so we're not, on we're not day in our facilities on, on, on numbers, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Dr. Box. So we're not, we're not talking, we're not talking about, you know, we have the space and we're under the number of kids and aren't using the space properly. We're over the number of kids. So we're talking about changing academics because we're over enrollment numbers. No, I don't think, I don't think anyone's talking about changing academics. And I think, um, uh, I think there's even a comment in there as well about um, Jackson. I think Jackson and Midtown have both proved that they've um, produced great outcomes and offered great programming, even with tight um, numbers in their schools. And so what we're trying to do is just figure out um, what's working, what we can expand, what we can enhance um, while balancing it with how we calculate capacity, which is not as easy as you've seen through this process of just um, X number of classrooms as Y number of kids, because we can just change the use of a classroom and then it changes. So uh, that's part of the, the conversation, the collaboration. Okay, and then I just wanted to um, suggest that you did mention participating with Go Team, but um, outside of that Go Team, you know, the I don't even know how many other people are in our cluster. I guess over well over two thousand are only allowed two minutes with no engagement. So um, the Go Team is really not a great way to engage about these as someone who doesn't have a seat at the Go Team because there is no back and forth. We've learned a lot, I think, over the last couple of years with the new K five, with the principals process that's been going on um, about how to engage and improvements in engagement. So I appreciate meetings are coming up in February. And um, because this does impact every school in this cluster, as we all matriculate up to the high school, um, please make sure that this information is getting to the elementary, middle and high schools about the meetings and maybe add some more um, at the different school levels, because we definitely all need a voice. And we saw that when we didn't do that in the new K-5, um, we saw a lot of spring offs and last minute concerns that voices weren't heard or they weren't brought to the table. So please, as a parent of a fourth grader, sixth grader and eighth grader, um, we need to do more than go team meetings and two minute comments um, on this engagement and probably more than the February meetings, but I haven't seen those meetings. I would love to see what you have designed and how to reaching out to the elementary and middle school level in these conversations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dion, thanks for that feedback. Well, Keisha, I just want to make sure we're going to stay on Midtown. And, and um, you know, you know, I'll we'll definitely come back if you have other comments. Oh, no, we're going we to stay on Midtown. OK, all right. Bring it on. Very clear. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my question was um, around special needs um, kids with behavior. So um, I found that kids are being sent home if they're having trouble. They're being sent home and they have these unexcused absentees and they're being suspended but they're being suspended with no paperwork this has been happening for a while now um and it, it got worse at school return what is being done to make sure because I, I know uh my cousin just went back to school last week I asked his mom I said hey did you get his work uh he wasn't suspended this time um, but I said, did you get his work? And she said, no. Now he was out because of COVID. Somebody tested positive and he tested positive as well. He was out because, you know, he had to stay out, but he got no work. We need to really pay attention because she said, yeah, his braid is a C. So, you know, if he doesn't get this work, he could possibly fail. And I thought the protocol was that when these kids test positive, they can go home with their work but that's not happening. So please look into that. But back to the unexcused absentees, because that, that, I don't know how they're marking that as well when they're out other than it's unexcused. But when these kids are having issues in school and the school don't want certain stuff to reflect in the records, it's an unexcused absent. And that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, if you're going to suspend them, you know, send them home with the proper paperwork. Don't tell a mom who has to work or have other priorities that, hey, um, you need to come get him. Like, this is what parents are hearing. Come get him, come get her, you know, and keep them out for a day, two or three, then they can come back. Um, I don't know who can speak to that and why that's happening. And it's not just happening in the Midtown cluster, but since we own Midtown, I know personally it is happening there and not the high school, but inside the cluster. 
All right, Lakeisha, I appreciate that feedback. Um, Travis, we have anyone who can help with this? I believe Dr. I want to put Dr. Florence on the um, either Dr. Florence or, or uh, Dr. Smith. I'm not sure if either of you um, have feedback on either special education or discipline or anything from Ms. Howell. Yeah, uh, good morning. I can I can jump in to start. Certainly, um, you know, with the discipline, Ms. Howell, and, and in, in the opportunity, if uh, they certainly should uh, should have the we have policies and procedures and we should be following those policies and procedures. And, you know, if a child has uh, received uh, discipline, they should be uh, that should be documented. Um, and then they should also have the opportunity uh, to, to make up their work in an excused absence uh, situation as well, which is a separate uh, piece. My, my encouragement would be um, in the absence of uh, Mr. Brown being here today, who's our associate clusters uh, superintendent, to be reaching out to that school and um, in engaging with the leadership at the school level first and foremost. But it's certainly I appreciate the, the feedback raising that. And it's something that, uh, you know, that our team can uh, t can look into because you're absolutely right. Uh, um, there should be, uh, we, we have procedures around that that we should be uh, always following. Right. Now, for the record, I did um, send Mr. Brown an uh, email uh, when this was brought to my attention last year, but they had a whole investigation going on at the time. So I don't know if he had access to his email address at the time, but I haven't seen him no more since then. Um, I did reach out to the school leadership, but it's clear that she um she just sent the kids home you know she just asked the mom you know stop whatever you're doing come get him or her versus he has an IEP or she has an IEP there should be a plan in there to make sure and I don't know if Emanuel Four is on the call which she should be um but it you know he he should have a plan or she should have a plan um that you know if something happened but what we found out is the reason why he was having an issue because the principal said, I don't have enough teachers to make sure that these kids are in the proper place. So that's a whole nother story, but that is the reason why kids are um, in situations where they probably would get in trouble because you have a lot of kids in one classroom and they, they, they shouldn't be. Yes, yes, ma'am. I pre yeah, I appreciate this uh, this feedback, and and we will our team will uh, will follow up with you for, so we can uh, address the individual situation. But appreciate it as as a, as broader something to to be aware of. So thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, well, Keisha, thank you, um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for for uh, helping out with that. Um, Cindy Ivy, good morning. Welcome. Uh, ready to hear uh, your comments or questions. Good morning. How is everybody doing? Um, addressing a couple of issues. Um, number one, the overcrowding and midtown. I'm not um in that cluster, but I can speak on overcrowding um because of the school that I've been in that has been overcrowded. My concern with the overcrowding, and I share with the other young lady that uh, spoke before, Waikisha, I think her name was Dion. If the school gets too crowded, then how will the kids be able to get an effective education? It's hard enough now for the teachers to teach the kids effectively with 25, 30 students to a classroom. If you're having over the number of kids and you don't know what you're going to do, then I agree that kind of ties the hands of the parents to be able to opt into moving their kids or taking advantage of the out-of-zone transfers, if you may, going to charter schools or private schools or to another school that can handle the capacity. The danger in that, though, is that when you move them and your attendance get low, then we have conversations about needing to close schools and merge schools. And then they still get overcrowded. So I'm just a little bit concerned being a parent, being a PTA member and a GO team member that kids will not be able to get an effective education if the classes are overcrowded. Teachers can't teach effectively. We're overcrowded. Then going to, you know, the 
question about special needs kids. If the school is overcrowded, then how do we service effectively the need the kids that have special needs, learning disabilities? You can't service them in a school that's overcrowded. I've been on several meetings with Waikisha and I, you know, appreciate it because she speaks to the level of where I am is the kids with disabilities. As I see it, because I visit many schools, the kids with special needs and disabilities are already somewhat underserviced as it is. As it is, they're underserviced. They don't get all the services that they need. If parents have to work, then they don't get to oversee as much as they should. A lot of the services that the children should get, they don't get. And if you overcrowd the school, now you're potentially leaving those kids out. So how is that going to be handled? And I'm in agreement with, you know, Waikisha. Kids with special needs are being treated unfairly when it comes to their discipline. Because when they come in with an IEP, especially when it's behavioral, they get a bill. So are we sending them home without following the bill? The answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. If you're suspending them, you're sending them home, they don't have the work, then they're already sitting in a classroom where they're not getting what they need, it's bound to be trouble. This is becoming an issue and it's ongoing. So how are we going to, in the future, handle this? And sitting here, now I'm a little bit concerned because you're about to be overcapacitated with kids that are coming way beyond the enrollment of the school. So how are all of those needs going to be addressed? You know, I, and I'm for all of the kids, all of the kids. But I'm really for the special needs kids because if they're already struggling, now they're in the school where it's overcapacitated, how are the teachers going to be able to meet the needs of those students to keep them where they need to be? And yes, even though they've turned out record numbers in success, after a while, it's going to be failure because of burnout. They're going to get, after a while, the teachers are going to get tired. They're going to get tired then your success rate is going to drop. And that's a big concern. It's not fair. Uh, Miss Ivy, I really appreciate your feedback. Um, I, and I think, um, I just wanna make sure we stay on task. We're, we're trying to talk about specifically Midtown capacity and I appreciate, uh, as a special needs parent, I do appreciate uh, that's the what attention. That's we are on the Midtown capacity because I know there's special needs kids there. Yes, ma'am. And I appreciate all the comments with respect to special education and the need to make sure that we're paying attention to uh, the needs of, of uh, our special needs population and, and, and their attention with respect to capacity at the Midtown Cluster. Um, my son was there last year and they're, they're, we really do have a, a good layout uh, at Midtown for our special needs uh, self-contained classrooms specifically. Um, so um, hopefully that will continue to stay in place as as uh, as the enrollment grows. So I really appreciate your feedback. Does anyone from the administration have any comments with respect to um, uh, Cindy Ivey's uh, comments? I put it in the chat board member Olympiadis, but thank you, Ms. Ivey. Uh, special education is part of our facilities conversation, both at a regional unit level, also a school level. And so completely agree um, that all students and, and all programming is part of this conversation. Great. Thank you, Travis. Thank you so much. Um, so with respect to that, I think I don't see any more hands up with respect to the Midtown capacity. I think we all recognize the fact that there, there's some work that needs to be done. I see Tamara's put her hand back up. Mr. Drake did have to leave. So um, just so you know, I'm sure Travis is kind of following up to make sure that Mr. Drake has what he needs. Tamara. Yeah, this is real quick. Um, uh, people have been asking, you know, what is the schedule for completing the facilities master plan? Because we're not done. And um, when should, when do we anticipate that being done? Um, I don't know, since Mr. Drake popped off, if anyone can answer that, Travis. 
Yeah, I'll get with, um, I would hate to say something that um, facilities disagrees with. So um, I'll get with uh, Dan to make sure that we respond to see uh, the scope of the plan, when was done, and if not, what's the next steps. Thank you. Perfect. Um, the next item that I have on the agenda, which has um, kind of um, become a, a concern across uh, the Midtown cluster, um, is the uh, pre-K options in the Midtown cluster or pre-K options uh, overall. Um, so uh, I know that there's many folks from uh, Mary Lynn that are very disappointed that Mary Lynn does not have a pre-K option uh, for this upcoming school year. Um, uh, I do want to make sure that we all are aware of the fact that um, we continue to have pre-K options at Hope Hill Elementary School, and we also continue, uh, and we will have uh, options this coming fall um, at the at the new elementary school, the new Highland, uh, Virginia Highland Elementary School. We will have uh, pre-K options there. Um, I also want to make sure, and I'm going to stick it in the chat, there's the link to all the pre-K sites. I also wanted to point out that Whiteford Elementary School um, has pre-K options as well. And although it's in the Jackson cluster, it is kind of down the street from um, the, the Mary Lynn um, Elementary School. Um, I understand that there's folks in the community that would really like for Mary Lynn to have a pre-K. Um, and I'm sure that we can consider that uh, moving forward. Um, and I, I know that the community, um, and I don't know when they were told this, but I've heard from many, many folks in the community that at some point they were told that Mary Lynn, Springdale Park, and the new Virginia Highland would have some sort of pre-K option. Obviously, that did not um, occur because the pre-K options are listed. And like I said, I stuck the link there. Um, and we are fortunate to continue to have Hope Hill serve as a pre-K site. And we'll be adding on the Virginia Highland site. Um, which I assume will at least have one pre-K class and potentially two. I don't, I don't necessarily know. I'm sure once um, someone may be able to speak to that who's joined us today. But then again, we have Whiteford uh, literally right down the street um, that has um, a long, has a huge, um, has you know, it's a whole building that's uh, devoted to early learning. Um, so if anyone uh, is with us from the administration who'd like to speak to this, I would certainly appreciate it. Good morning um, to all, and thank you, Board Member Olympiadas, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Selena Florence, and I am the Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. And we do have several um, members of our early learning team here this morning. Um, our director, Joy Bradley, is with us, and then our coordinator, Bridget Bailey, is also with us. And so I just want to start by saying, um, to clear up any confusion, we applied for classrooms at Spark and at Mary Lynn and at the new elementary school. And so I think that's where some of the confusion may have come. We did submit an application for those, but unfortunately the state denied two of those, um, those sites. And so I will let um, Bridget Bailey speak to more of that, that it was our intent to have, it's our intent to have pre-K at every school, um, but we do have to go through a process to make sure that happens if they are going to be funded by the state. And we did submit ap applications for Spark and Mary Lynn and um, the new Virginia Highlands, and we wrongly approved for the new Virginia Highlands. So I will let um, uh, Ms. Bailey provide some more information on that. Thank you, Dr. Florence. Good morning, and thank you so much for having us. So I do want to bring some clarity around um, the, how the process works when we are applying for pre-K. So the application doesn't actually open until February. So when we have interests, what we do is we contact our state representative, the person that we work with, and we tell that we give them addresses. So we say we're potentially thinking about either opening a new program, moving a program, and we give them, we provide them with addresses because, and the reason we have to do that is because there are so many child care centers that offer the Georgia pre-K program that they look at the address to see if it's in a saturated area. The way we even begin to think about it is usually from principal interest. And that happens usually a year before because even though the, the application may open in February where we can apply, we have to begin our process a whole lot earlier because of the way our application is set up. We work with software developers. It's not uh, an easy process. We have to consider staffing. There's a whole lot of factors that go into us even thinking about opening a new program. But we do always take the interest of principals. So they reach out where we want a pre-K. 
and then we'll go, we'll begin the process. And that is usually between 12 to 18 months prior to us beginning the process. So um, we did get interest from Maryland. We got interest from um, Principal Harness at, at Springdale Park when he was there. So when he gave me, he gave me the interest, that was probably, I would say the interest began with him before Joy and I even became in this, before we got into this role. So that is how we knew that he was interested in the program. The former director left the transition plan and said, reach out to Spark. They are interested in a program. And that is what we did. We began meeting with him probably about November, 2021 is when we began meeting with him. So that kind of gives you an idea of how long it takes for us to begin and go through the process of having new programs. So that is how it happened at Spark. And when we reached out to him, we met. And then at one meeting, um, that is when he told me he was gonna be the principal of the new elementary school. We submitted the address, the state came back for Spark and said, we have uh, child care centers in that area, it's already saturated and they're not full. So in good partnership, we wouldn't want to potentially open up a program at Spark that would close child care centers that are in that area. So that was a no for Spark, but that was a year, over a year in the planning. And that is how we were able to to come to the decision that we wouldn't be able to open one at Spark this year. Things change every year, programs open, close. We, we look at them every single year. At that point, Principal Harness then stated, well, what about Virginia Highlands? And I was like, okay, I didn't even know, you know that there was a new school opening. I don't know how I missed it, but Virginia Highlands. So I sent the address into the state preliminary to, to check and they said, that's fine. There are not any childcare centers around that school that you would be competing with. You're more than welcome to either add or move a class to that school. That is how we came up with Virginia Highlands. Mary Lynn reached out to us first in October of this year. Mind you, our application opened on Monday. So she reached out on in October, which is way past the deadline that we would usually begin our planning process. But we still were like, okay, let, let's see if we can work Maryland in this some kind of way. I reached out to the state and they, and they did say, well, there aren't any really competing daycare centers. What is your enrollment looking like? And that is when I went back and had to start digging through our data to kind of just look at our enrollment overall as a district and then in Midtown Cluster. We do know that there are interest surveys that went out. Um, I believe they began looking in October, you know, to see if there was even interest in the community. And it came back pretty, pretty high level of interest for Midtown. So we do understand that there is a, a want and a need in that it will want not necessarily a need in that area. So it was definitely on our radar, but it wasn't on our radar until October. So because it takes 12 to 18 months to do the beginning planning of opening a new program, which we weren't doing this year, Dr. Florence, we actually were moving um, programs this year because of our low enrollment. And to give you just an overall picture of what that looks like, pre-COVID, our enrollment was 97%. The year of COVID, it dropped to 77% total enrollment in the district. We went back up to about 90, and this year we're at 91. So when we think about opening new schools, we have to look at our overall enrollment district. I mean, our overall enrollment as a district, and then we break it down to clusters. And that is how we can go to the state and say, as a district, we would like to apply for new classrooms. So a lot of factors go into us making the decision to open a new classroom, which we are not doing next school year at all. We are only moving a class to Virginia Highlands from low enrollment area to Virginia Highlands because we do understand that there was only one, one option, which was Hope Hill in Midtown Cluster. We want to continue to grow in that cluster because we do see now that enrollment is growing in that cluster. So that is kind of an overview of why Mary Lynn won't be getting one this year and why Springdale Park won't. Now, Mary Lynn will definitely be on our radar now that we know we have plenty of time to plan for the next school year. In Springdale Park, we can come back to the table with the state again and have them look at the address again to see if that's a possibility as well. So that is how our, that is our plan on how we're gonna increase our enrollment and our pre-K options in the Midtown cluster. But yes, Hope Hill is an option. Virginia Highlands is an option. They don't have to be your zone school for you to apply. You can apply to any program within Atlanta Public Schools for pre-K. And I know that was a lot, so, and I know we have a lot of questions popping in, so I'll be happy to go answer them. If I can get some help in the chat. Uh, yeah, there's, it looks like there's plenty of questions in the chat, and I see that um, Emily has raised her hand. Um, okay. Good morning, Emily. 
Good morning, and thank you for having this call. Um, yes, as a, a parent that has a child at, at Mary Lynn currently and also has um, two children coming up the pipe. Um, I'm obviously Mary Lynn is a community or their community was really hit hard by the Inman Park decision to move those those students out. And it was really, really a difficult thing for our community to deal with the loss of that, that our sister community across Moreland. So it was something that we were pretty disappointed about, about to lose that. And the only thing I think that was like the silver lining about that is the suggestion throughout the process that with the increased space then at Mary Lynn that a pre-K would be an option. And so I guess the Mary Lynn community, and I, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but it feels at least the ones that I've spoken to feel a little bit bruised by the, uh, the idea that again the resource went to the Virginia Highland right. um, you know school so I, I I think as parents I would kind of speak to what Dion suggested earlier which is how if, uh, as we have as parents can now advocate for this mm -hmm. uh, because this is something that I think is really important as we kind of rebuild our our school and kind of you know go forward with a, a new you know kind of <laughs> a new era of Mary Lynn um, and certainly um, building that community as as we heard earlier about the tumor uh, elementary school, how, how can we do that as uh, parents? So long story short, how can we advocate harder as parents from a precarious Mary Lynn? Yes, I definitely um, understand. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be an advocate, but we have a process and it's it's very difficult to go outside of the process because we work on timelines when it comes to anything that we do through the state, it's it's a state funded program. So we are definitely looking at it for next school year, but the timeline has passed for this school upcoming school year. It's it's driven, it's data driven, it's enrollment data driven, and it is um, we look at wait list in the cluster. Hope Hill doesn't have a wait list. If it had a wait list of two or three classes, I could probably have pushed something, but it doesn't. So we have to look at the data that's associated with how our process works with applying for pre-K classrooms and it's not just a state we have processes through the office of early learning as well all righty thank you i think board member olympiadis ran uh had some technical difficulties so uh board hey, member keith, can i keith yep, can i ask a question that's in just i uh, wanted to capture a couple of the questions in the chat for uh yep. bailey dr florence um if if there is no um, pre-K funded through the district, basically, are there any other alternatives? So are, does there exist um, private pre-Ks in current public schools? Um, is there, can the school supplement the funding? Um, are there options outside of um, what has been attempted so far to address the concern on pre-K? Yes, um, there are private centers that offer Georgia free pre-K programs in the surrounding areas. Um, luckily with us, we have we give three options when, when parents apply for our program. So they have three choices that they can make. They can be two, there are two choices in Midtown. There's Whiteford that's right around the corner that has 66 spots available. There are um, classes that are in the North Atlanta at the, on the south side of the North Atlanta cluster that have spots available. There um, has been in the past, and this is long before um, I became the coordinator, that schools actually, I think Maryland was one of them that actually had their own funded program in there that was separate from the district. So that is also a possibility if they have the funds. We don't have the funds in the Office of Early Learning to open and operate a pre-K program. We are state funded, and some of them are even Head Start funded. So we don't have the funds for it, but schools are more than welcome to apply through the state on their own and fund their own programs. And we would be happy to, of course, offer any kind of support that we could from our office, but we, we don't have funding from our office to do that. But they're more than welcome to reach out to the state and fund their own programs. So and I'll jump in um, to help out here while um, Michelle is trying to get back on. Um, I think the question was specifically, um, can private pre-K programs occupy space in one of our schools that has capacity. And technically, nothing, I, I mean, you know, just from a technical perspective, we can lease space within currently, buildings we're currently using where we have access to a private, um, you know, to 
I mean, for, yes, for no, anything, I really. I totally understand so, your question. So we have yeah. at the Early Learning Center at Whiteford, there is a private pre-K program within our building. So that is something that will have to be done through whatever department. I'm not quite sure, but there are, that we do actually have that at Whiteford Early Learning Academy. And, so that is a possibility, yes. And when we um, changed our board policy recently about how, like how our buildings could be used, we specifically, um, while we excluded, you know, competing K through 12, we did not exclude pre-K. Um, so we left that open. Um, yes, and I see that uh, people would obviously prefer the lottery funded pre-K. Um, you know, let's help lobby with the state to get more pre-K dollars, you know, as much as we can. We're, we're working with the city, I'm on the joint committee, um, working with city council, because I know the mayor's office is devoted to early learning. Um, and just looking forward to seeing what that's going to be. You know, um, Mayor Dickens is calling this the year of the youth. Um, and early education is one of the focuses. So um, that is something that certainly we can raise during those discussions to see how we might partner um, and bring, obviously, our asset, which in this case is available space, um, to the service of the community. So yes. I, will I will take that forward. And it is our goal to have one in every school. That has been our goal. It is still our goal. We just have to have a process. And when we're looking at numbers and we're still considering this post-COVID almost, but we are still recovering from it. And our numbers are, are going up, but they're not where they need to be for us to be asking for additional funding because we are still, and I'll give you just, just one more thing. One more fact is the state, we, we were short almost four, over four classes this particular school year. And, and the, the way the state funds us, they fund us per pupil, per student, per person that's sitting in a chair. And we were under, we would have been underfunded by four classrooms, 22 kids per classroom. The state held us harmless and continued to pay us for those students so that we wouldn't lose classrooms, so we wouldn't lose teachers. So in as a good partner, we didn't feel like it would be a good place for us to say, give me 66 more seats, but you paid me for 93 that we didn't fill this year. So we want to continue to grow and get our numbers back up before we go to the state to extend the program even more. So that is our goal, but we anticipate it being back where, where it was pre-COVID and we anticipate adding on classes every year, but we have to continue to follow the process and continue to have a strong relationship with our funders. Um, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For, yeah. Thank you, Bridget. Um, uh, Paula, I see your hand is up. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to give a very brief history to Ms. Bailey. Thank you so much for your participation. I'm learning a lot. Um, Mary Lynn had right from the start pre-K. It was state funded the whole time. Yes, okay. state funded outside of the APS pre-K program. But yes, yes that's what it was we're saying. They can, definitely house, be, but, yeah. they can apply and have it, they can apply themselves for a state funded program. Yes, absolutely. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Paula. Um, Sherry, good morning. Welcome. Hi, good morning. Um, <clears throat> well, it looks like Travis actually just answered my question. So um, I don't agree. I don't have one. Sorry. Okay. No worries. No worries no, at no. all. If, for those who are driving, just if you reach out to me, I'll um, I'll connect you to the facilities team. For those places that are interested in leasing space, I'll put you in contact with the right person so that um, they can talk about how that works uh, with Primavera or other uh, entity. Perfect. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, is there any further comment about pre-K uh, with respect? Um, um, I really appreciate uh, Ms. Florence and uh, Ms. Bailey just going through what the process has been and how uh, we work with the state to try to get these programs in place. Lisa, I see your hands up. Good morning. I, I just, just a comment because I'm not affected by the pre-K. I'm not a Maryland parent, but I did listen to all the meetings and it feels like this is something of a gap in communication where I remember, you know, part of the benefits, as we heard, was the silver linings being that more schools could have pre-K, which as even as a parent who's just more interested in more pre-K for the sake of our uh, Atlanta, um, that was a benefit for some of the disruption. So I just feel like 
that maybe could have been better explained the process um, rather than just throwing out, hey, you know, one of the benefits is more pre-K. But oh, by the way, there's all these other, you know, there, there's no guarantee. So I, I definitely did not hear, I, I don't think any of us who've never been through this really understand the complexity. So just, you know, just a thought for next time, if, if those, APS is a big organization, lots of moving parts. So I think if, if silver linings are put out there, maybe just, you know, give all the warts and all perspective of some of those so that people don't feel like they're losing out on something maybe they thought they might get with some of this disruption. Because I find these explanations really helpful in understanding. I go to a lot of meetings, that's the first I've ever heard. And Ms. Bailey, thank you, because that was um, a great, I, from my perspective, I thought it was a great explanation. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah. Um, I think we've all learned a lot this morning with respect to pre-K and um, appreciate everyone's advocacy around trying to support the Midtown cluster and, and our continued growth. Um, I'm sure we'll start to see that over um, in East Atlanta as well. And we'll need, uh, Whiteford will continue to, to grow and fill up and it will be using space over there much sooner than, than we uh, partic particularly uh, may have anticipated. Um, all right, so I think we've pretty much covered capacity and facilities. If anyone has any further comments, um, let's take them at this time. Uh, and then I'd like to move on to uh, some other issues that we, we have. Okay, then hearing none, I want to go over some of the some of the comments that I've heard from the community uh, most recently uh, with respect to uh, what is going on. Um, I want to start with this one that is quite sensitive and, and be very direct about where we're going to go with this conversation, which is really nowhere today. I, I have received a tremendous amount of uh, feedback with respect to what is going on with an HR issue at Springdale Park. I have forwarded all of that information and there, I've gotten more over the past couple of days that I will continue to forward to the administration to um, respond uh, to uh, to constituents who are concerned about uh, what is happening at Spark. To be perfectly clear, we cannot discuss this. This is an HR matter, um, and I will allow the administration to respond appropriately to each constituent. This is not something that the board is involved with, and this is not something that we will discuss. So I just want to make sure that you are aware and that the community is aware that while um, you are more than welcome to contact me as your board member or, or any board member for that matter. What will continue to happen is that that information will be shared with the administration and the administration will respond appropriately to how they are managing this particular situation. Um, with that said, we'll move on to um, a new HR uh, and exciting news, which is our principal, our new principal, Miss um, Hollis over at Howard. Um, and my understanding is she had a uh, welcome yesterday while most of us were at the state of the district, or at least the board members were at the state of the district. I also heard that she was over at Morningside this morning for the principal's coffee. So it sounds as though the community is um, getting to know her as um, she takes over this new role. And I just wanted to make sure if anyone had any comments or concerns that they were allowed to uh, share them this morning um, so that we can make sure that the administration's aware. Okay, sounds like we're moving forward with that. And then I also wanted to make everyone aware, um, if you aren't already, that uh, Ms. Wheeler, who is the current principal at Hope Hill Elementary, has uh, announced that she will be retiring at the end of the school year. So um, obviously the, 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 the community um, at Hope Hill will be going through a new principal selection uh, process for the upcoming school year. Um, and um, I do believe, I mean, it is January, so I do believe we still have great time to find some really highly qualified candidates who would be interested in joining us um, at Hope Hill. So I just wanted to make sure that y'all were aware of that. Um, and Travis has posted in the chat uh, that... Sorry, just that the next... Um... Um, the meet and greet with uh, Principal Hollis was um, this week, but she's going to do um, another kind of huddle uh, January 25th, and it'll be live streamed uh, for those to access it virtually. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so with that said, those are really the, the hot topics, so to speak, that I, I have received um, from the community and wanted to make sure that we had addressed. 
um, and that y'all got some feedback on. And I really appreciate uh, the administration um, uh, listening to the community's concerns and making sure that there were staff here to appropriately address um, comments and questions um, from the community. At this point, I'm opening it up to any other concerns um, from the community or if there's other feedback from across the district um, that we need to be aware of so that we can move forward um, in making sure that we get things addressed. Okay, are y'all sure? Because with that said, ah, there's Paula. Okay, go on Paula. Um, I just wanted to thank, while everyone is here, um, Keith Glass, uh, who attended last night's Atlanta Council monthly meeting with the uh, APS student advisory team. And uh, Keith, would you, if you don't mind, drop the student council initiative into the chat so that everyone here in the Midtown cluster can see what the student advisory group is, is taking on. Um, you have done an inspiring job, Keith, and thank you very much for really getting in there and working uh, diligently, walking your talk with our students, with our high school students. It's a big challenge for you. And I just want to let everyone know that um, anytime we don't love Atlanta public schools, let's look at our longtime folks who have graduated from APS and have taken their own experiences and lives and put them forward to our children. And that definitely is Keith. And um, I see Keisha nodding. She is someone like that too. These are our APS graduates. And we are, I am so proud and thankful. And Michelle, thank you so much for coming last night. Our students are, you know, are on a path. And uh, the future is bright when it comes to engagement and community voice in Atlanta. And that's because of people here in this room who really do care about our kids. So I wanted to acknowledge and uh, thank you for our great meeting last night. And I hope you will thank your students on behalf of Atlantans across the city who sat down and listened to them. Thanks, Paula. And I also wanna recognize that my colleague Tamara Jones uh, joined as well and was able uh, yes. to Yes, she was did. able to uh, mm -hmm. participate a little bit longer than uh, than myself because I had a previous meeting and was, uh, but was glad I was able to catch uh, catch the majority or, or a good part of your meeting. Before. As well as board member Mitchell. So we right. had three board members last night spending their time with our high school students and Keith and also uh, Rose uh, Prejean Harris, who is doing a great job with the students with SEL. So we have a lot to be proud of. So thank you, everybody. I just wanted to acknowledge. Great, thank you, Paula. Um, I see that Jessica Johnson, as y'all may know, is our newly appointed uh, seat nine representative on the Atlanta Board of Education. Hey, Jessica, good morning. I'm so glad you were able to join us. Um, I hope everyone can welcome her uh, and I would, would love to hear her comments. Yeah, good morning. I, I had an opportunity to dial in a little later and just to listen, but I just wanted to formally introduce myself as the at-large Seat 9 representative and looking forward to having an opportunity to meet you all and, and learn more about your, your community needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I thought, Raynard, there you go. Oh, I, I thought I saw your hand up. Good morning, Raynard. How are you? Good morning, my, uh, board member Olympianalis. Good morning, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. I have a quick question. How can someone find out the breakdown of, since, it, since this was discussed earlier regarding um, students that were being sent home or suspended, how can someone get a breakdown as to the, the, the percentage of students that are suspended that are special needs or those are, that are on IEPs versus the regular population of non-IEP students? Um, I, I'm i sure we could provide that information. Um, I I will have to ask, um, that's... The, the reason why I'm asking that question is because it's been brought to my attention that here in the Mays Cluster, it is a 
surprisingly large number percentage of students, twice the state average of students that are suspended, those that are with IEPs or special needs versus regular students. Um, okay, I've written that down, Raynard, and I will follow back up with you. I will say that um, I don't know, I appreciate that you have that information, but when those types of things occur, if, if that is the case, um, uh, APS, um, I'm trying to find the right word this morning. Um, it is we receive a we we receive notification for that and then and then there are there are um, there are funding issues that that are that that come along with that. So um, let me look into that for you um, and we'll see what we can find. And Thank I'll you very much. Get, we'll get back to you on that. Thank you very much. Of course. All right. Uh, any further comments? Uh, oh, Jessica's back on. Yes, Jessica, is your hand still back up or is it still up or did you have another comment that you wanted to add? Sorry, it's still up. I couldn't get it. Oh, there we oh, go. No worries. Sorry. No, no worries. I just wanted to make sure. Um, are there any further comments or questions or anything that we can address or answer this morning, especially since we have so many folks from uh, the administration here? All right, then um, hearing none, I really appreciate everyone um, joining today. Um, my understanding is- um, We have one more uh, board member Olympiadis, Maria. Yes, tell me hey. again. Hey. Hey, Maria. Oh. hey, Maria, how are you? Good morning, I'm, I apologize. Oh, no, that's okay. I, I was trying to like unmute myself and then raise my hand at the same time. So um, <laughs> I had a quick question. So I've had a couple teachers recently who have expressed frustration that they are still continuing to test for COVID on a mandated basis, weekly basis. And it comes at the time during their um, planning time. And I think that's also been a concern about planning time that the teachers don't have enough. And um, it, it's kind of concerning to me as a parent that now the sudden, you know, I've got an elementary and high school kids in the elementary schools, they're doing some of the testing during the planning time and or in front of the children. And I'm wondering when it's going to end or when it can be made more of a choice to give that time back to the teachers. Um, is there anyone from the administration who can answer that? Uh, I don't see Dr. Hildreth. I'll, um... I'll reach out to Dr. Hildreth and see what the plans are um, for COVID testing. Okay, all right, Travis, just let me know. And um, Maria, you have my number, don't you? I sure do. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, yeah, just uh, just text me over, and um, and and then when I hear back from Travis, I'll let you know what the response is, and um, and make sure we get you answered. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Have a great day. You too. A good weekend. Uh, any any further questions or comments from anyone? Um, and I'll go ahead. I, I, I don't. When I say that that she has my number, all of y'all can have my number. It's not. Um, it's you know, it's not some sort of CBD number. Um, Akeem, yes, you have a, a final comment for us today. Yes. Um... I just want to know, um, well, I know is the board's governance to hold the leadership accountable um, and APS. I just see time and time again, APS leadership um, having more and more issues and it's affecting the 56,000 customers. Um, when are we going to address their issues? They don't get a second chance at education. And it's time for people to stop plan education and actually do the job of educating our scholars. The funding, the tax dollars, um, it's almost been wasted at this point. We need to do something for our communities, for our schools, to make sure our students have the best foot forward. Um, I'm a product of APS and I would like to see more successful products of APS. Right now, I just don't see that and this leadership is failing us. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Um, anything further? All right, well, hearing none, I, I wanna wish y'all a great weekend. And I, what I also wanted to say is I typically try to have uh, uh, my Zoom meetings on the third Friday of the month. 
Um, I did take November and December off because I feel like that's a really busy time for all of us and, and not necessarily where we need to be uh, focused uh, on anything other than our families and, and getting uh, being prepared for the holidays. Um, but moving forward, we're going to go uh, on those third Fridays of the month. And unless it, we might have a, a, a conflict uh, next month because of winter break. But we will we will figure that out and we will make sure that that gets on the board's calendar and I'll share that with y'all publicly as well. Um, and Travis, thanks for putting your contact information up there. Um, Tamara, thanks for sharing your number as well. Um, we are here to get the feedback and, um, and and share it with the administration so that we can figure out how to move forward uh, so that everyone can have a really great experience. Um, always feel free to reach out. Uh, and like I said, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Can't thank all the APS uh, folks for joining this morning and being supportive um, and, and listening to what the community's concerns are and being ready to address them. I really appreciate it. And I think the community does too. Uh, with that said, I hope everybody, like I said, has a great weekend and we'll see you again soon. Have a great weekend, everyone.